Hello and welcome everyone. There will be some more people trickling through, but we'll be sure to accommodate them. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. I'm Paul Sutter. I'm the chief scientist here at COSI, and I'm also an astrophysicist at OSU. And I will be your MC tonight, which means it's my job to get out of the way. And the very first person that's going to give us a little intro to COSI is COSI's executive vice president of engagement and impact. Please welcome Azuka Moon. and welcome to co Whether this is your first time at co or if you're a frequent guest, we thank you so very much for coming out this evening and please come back and see us again often. I'm especially excited this evening to welcome you to co on behalf of our president and CEO, Dr. Frederick Bertley, who sends his regards. He's been delayed on the East Coast by a nor'easter so he couldn't be here this evening. I welcome you on behalf of our entire COSI team and of course our partners from OSU. We welcome you to this exciting evening. Partnerships are very important for COSI and we've enjoyed a long partnership with OSU. And let me tell you, these partnerships have been very diverse. From our partnership with our Labs in Life, which is located just above this theater and where real research happens every day, and our guests can see that research. It's everything from where little children can participate to adults. Research happening every day. And COSI and OSU have partnered on everything from federal grants to explore how uh, science learning affects young children, to shared positions, internships, fellowships, field practicums, and much more. We partner together on site, off site, and even online. We have a partnership with the Wexner Medical Center that allows us to stream a kidney transplant to schools across the country. So it's very important for us both to use partnerships to meet our mission and really serve those communities that we both are engaged with. Now, we know that you all had different places you could be tonight. So we thank you so very much for coming out to hear our conversation tonight. We know that it will be eye-opening, mind-expanding, and I tend to think that some of these conversations will just be out of this world. Bad pun, but I couldn't resist. But with that, sit back, enjoy, and I'll ask Dr. Sutter to come back to the stage. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Oh, that is not the last bad pun of the evening, I guarantee it not if I'm NC. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce the guy who's going to introduce the guy who's the reason we're all here. Please welcome Professor John Beacom, Director of OSU's Center for Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics, and the reason 98% of us are here. Good evening. On behalf of the Center for Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics, welcome to this special event. So our center is designed to explore the universe and its amazing contents, to train the next generation of scientists on those uh, interesting questions, and importantly, also we have an outreach component, which is to help reach the next, next generation of scientists. And that's a big part of why we have public lectures. And also to keep lifelong learners engaged in what we're doing, and share the fruits of our research. Now in carrying that out, one of the ways we've been able to do that is a generous donation from the Baird family in honor of Captain Forrest Baird, who you can read about in the program. It's a really interesting um, history, and uh, I encourage you to read it, and we're grateful to the Baird family for that success in, in establishing this series. This is the 10th uh, occurrence of the Baird Lecture, and we're very honored tonight to have Professor Mike Brown from Caltech. <laughs> Simply put, he's the world's leading expert on what's in the solar system, and that's what you'll be hearing about tonight. So. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Mike Brown. Thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me to be here for this, and uh, thanks to everyone for, for coming out on for, for me as a Southern Californian. This is like the coldest night that I've ever experienced in my life, so it must be terrible. I'm so glad you guys came out here. I'm going to tell you a story about what, what we're doing um, down at Caltech, which in our search for this new planet in the outer solar system, but to tell you about this 
this search for Planet Nine, I really need to take you back to the very first planetary discoveries that, that humans ever made. So let me take you back 240 years. You think about 240 years ago, everybody could see all the planets in the solar system. The most distant planet in the solar system was Saturn. And as far as I can tell, I, I've, been, I've been trying to read to see if there's any, been any discussion back in the, in the 1780s. Nobody was ever really thinking about there might be more planets. Telescopes had been invented a couple hundred years by then. People had been looking at stars in the sky, knew that there were new stellar discoveries all the time. But nobody was thinking that, that there should be any more planets. The solar system clearly ended at Saturn, just like you could see it. This all changed by, uh, you could call it an accident, but, it, but often in science, accidents are the result of a scientist carefully doing something and realizing that he's seeing something that he didn't see. And this was uh, William Herschel, who was cataloging stars in the sky. He was making his catalog. He would look up through his telescope and write them down and look here and write down the coordinates. And he had built this telescope that, that gave more precise images than any telescope had ever given before, crisper images. And so he looked at one star, and it looked fuzzy. You know, if, you, if you have a good telescope, your stars look like little points of light and things that are fuzzy. He knew it wasn't a star. Now, there, there are fuzzy things in the sky. There are galaxies. There are, there are other things, there are nebulae that, that look sort of fuzzy. So he thought, okay, it's just one of those. But he was smart enough to come back and look the next day. When he came back and looked the next day, it was still fuzzy, and it moved. And that was it. Once you realize that it's not in the same place, two nights in a row, you realize you've found something, not a galaxy far away, not a nebula, but you've actually found something in our solar system. He was reluctant um, to call it a planet. Uh, you, could, you could pretty quickly realize it was very far away, it was beyond the orbit of Saturn, and it took a long time before he was willing to say that this thing might actually be a planet. And just because I, I think, really, this is one of the more profound discoveries in, in the solar system. Nobody really thought that there should be more planets, and I think it just kind of blew his mind, and he didn't want to didn't want to have his mind blown. That's, that's my guess. Um, so people realized early on that it was pretty far away, but they, they argued about whether it was a planet, maybe it was one of those comets that people had found before. And you know, the big difference at the time, people thought, between comets and planets, comets come on those orbits that come in close to the sun, and then you can go really far away, as far away as, as that thing that he found was. Um, planets go in these circular orbits. So people wanted to know, is it in a circular orbit around the sun? Or is it in a, an orbit that looks like a comet? So nobody knew the answer to this for uh, for about 20 years, and it took it took till 1820 when an uh, astronomer at the university at, at the uh, Paris Observatory, the director Alexis Bouvard, who's got a nice long title. I, I want a title this long one. That's good. That's pretty good. Um, he wrote this whole book on the uh, tables of Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus. It had gotten the name Uranus by this point. And the, the main point of his tables on Uranus was to show these uh, not very complicated equations. Um, you'll, you'll be quizzed a little bit later to see if you, if you understood them all. Um, but, but these equations describe where Uranus should be in the sky based on his calculations. And what he showed for the first time here in 1820 is that Uranus is on a circular orbit well outside of Saturn, and thus it's a planet. So that was the main point that he was making here. Yes, indeed, this thing is a planet. The solar system has yet another planet. Quite a surprise. Um, the other thing he found is that, well, if he, if he took his very nice theory on where things should be and compared it to where astronomers had, had found Uranus, so it was discovered in 1781, so people followed it all these years, all these years, all these years, all the way up to 1819. Um, but they also, and the reason he could actually find the orbit when no one else could, is because he went backwards in time. 1781, he actually uh, found it 10 years earlier. Uh, he found it all the way back to 1690 by basically saying, well, you know, if Uranus is going like this, then 10 years ago it should have been here. I'm going to look at this catalog of stars that some astronomer made, and look, there's a star there that's not there anymore. That was probably Uranus. So let's keep going backwards. And he went all the way back, as I said, to, to 1690. An astronomer made a catalog of stars, included Uranus in his catalog, but it wasn't there. If he'd gone back one day and looked again, he could have discovered Uranus all that time earlier. But what's interesting 
is that all of these observations from 1690 to 1819, this column shows how far off this theory is from where the observations are. You don't, you don't have to worry about the numbers, but you see pluses, minuses, a bunch of pluses, minuses, minuses for a while, pluses for a while. Um, Bouvard being a very good theorist, um, we have a lot of those these days. I know a lot of theorists, and I know what a theorist would say when, when confronted with this. And Bouvard says exactly the same thing, uh, that it's most likely that his theory is perfect and the observations are wrong. Um, <laughs> We all, we all know those people. Uh, but he does admit somewhere down here that there's an alternative that maybe, just maybe, there's something else beyond Uranus that's, that's tugging on Uranus that's making the positions be slightly off. That's a little crazy, but he, he suggests that you should watch Uranus very carefully from uh, 1820 on and be really good at your observations so you don't mess up like all these other people did and you'll find that his theory is perfect. So for the next 25 years, Astronomers continue to watch, and it, the theory wasn't perfect. It kept on having these, these errors that are about the same size. By about 1840, it was, it was generally accepted knowledge that there had to be another planet out there, um, that something was tugging along um, and moving Uranus, and that there had to be another one. And the only, the only hard part is nobody knew how to find it. Nobody knew how to use these uncertain these differences between the theory to, to point to where uh, the planet was in the sky. So along came, actually, not just along came, but, uh, but Bouvard handed his data to another astronomer at the um, observatory in Paris, um, the Verrier, and said, go find this thing. So the Verrier sat down and, and wrote a bunch of equations and, and realized that he could point to the position of a new planet by showing what these, uh, these offsets are. And he could predict exactly where it was in the sky. And he did. He gave a, he gave a talk at the, the National Academy in Paris. And I, I think after his talk, everybody was very impressed and they clipped their hands. And uh, he said, he said, good, let's, let's go find it. And you're like, mm -hmm. um, I Even as, as, as late as, as 1845 this was, I don't think people still really believed that you could use like, like math and physics to make predictions about reality. Um, that the idea that you could, you could, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a pretty theory that he could do, and he could make these calculations, and the math was beautiful, but it didn't mean there was a planet out there. It just meant there was a theory, and that was it. So they wouldn't look. Um, he eventually um, sent, uh, sent an email to the uh, uh, Berlin Observatory. Uh, maybe it was smoke signals, I'm not sure. Um, and he said, you know, I, 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 there's a planet here. Go look. And they, they opened up the telescope. And in the very first night of looking, it was right exactly where he said. Uh, this was a pretty amazing thing. So he got instantly very famous um, for having discovered a planet at the tip of his pencil, as it was called at the time. Um, he got instantly famous. And instantaneously, uh, a very obvious thing happened, which is that other astronomers were like, uh, uh, I, I want to get famous, um, <laughs> and realize that maybe they could predict, you know, as long as now there's a Uranus and there's a Neptune, and like, wow, well, maybe there's more. So people started predicting new planets like crazy. Uh, and when I say like crazy, a lot of them were crazy. Um, <laughs> so the very first prediction came within uh, a weeks of the various, uh, of the discovery of, of Neptune, and, and they were, you know, these like, well, I think it must be over here, with sort of no real argument why it should be there, and people would look and it wasn't there. And it, it kept on going like this for many years. Le Verrier even got into the act himself, not happy just to be semi-famous, he wanted to be super duper famous, I guess. So he actually um, looked at perturbations to Mercury and predicted that there was a planet inside the orbit of Mercury. This wasn't crazy. He actually, the math was the same math that he used here, and, and uh, it should have worked, except for that general relativity thing that messed up everything. So the reason that Mercury wasn't where it was supposed to be was because of general relativity, not because of the planet. I don't blame Leverrier for that one. Um, by about the, uh, the turn of the century, by the, by the 1900s, people had, you know, these predictions had come and gone, but there were now a group of people who were really trying hard to predict the existence of new, a new planet, a massive new planet out beyond Neptune. 
The, the most well-known of these uh, now, although not at the time, is, um, is Percival Lowell. Percival Lowell um, was, he's, he was also famous for, are there any Percival Lowell fans in the audience? Can I make fun of himself? Okay. Um, okay, so he was a bit of a nut job. Uh, he, was, he was famous, of course, for having seen the canals on Mars, which don't exist. Um, <laughs> And nobody believed him. He, he was like, only I can see them because my eyes are better than your eyes and my telescopes are better than your telescopes. Nobody believed them because they don't exist. Um, but he was convinced that if he could predict the location of a planet, people would believe he was a good astronomer, so they'd believe about the canals on Mars. Okay. Um, so he started making these predictions on a, a planet, and uh, he had a bunch of different predictions. There was planet P, it was planet O, and the one that everybody has always heard about is planet X. He was the first one to call it planet X, but X was not the first letter he used. He had all these other ones, too. Um, so he actually convinced astronomers at, uh, at the Mount Wilson Observatory, um, which is right behind my house in Pasadena. I can see it from my backyard. They, he, he convinced them to, to take a picture of the sky where he thought planet X would be, and they took a picture, and it kind of looked like this. Anybody see it? Yeah, I don't, I don't see it either. Um, so he despondently went back and eventually uh, passed away before um, Planet X was ever found. Also, there's no Planet X. But uh, before Planet X was ever found, he was despondent uh, was in World War One. He was, he, was uh, he was a pacifist. He was, he was also convinced that uh, the Martians lived in this utopian world. And the reason there were canals was because the Martians from the poles were sharing their water with the Martians at the equator, and we had to learn from Mars. He was, he was, he was kind of crazy. Um, so, but he did found the Lowell Observatory with the goal of looking for his, his planet X. He didn't find it by the time he passed away, but he had, he had hired uh, uh, Clyde Tombaugh um, straight off the farm as a 22-year-old kid to do this search for his planet X. And Clyde Tombaugh realized, he, he took a picture that looked sort of like this. In fact, he actually took this picture. Um, and looked at it was like, I, I, I don't even know what a planet would look like. So he realized very quickly that, very, that thing that I said about William Herschel doing is he, he would take a picture, and then he took a picture the next night, and he saw it move. You guys saw it move, right? Uh, I'm not sure you did. OK, let's try again. Here's the first night. Here's the second night. Who thinks they saw it? Okay, here's the first night. Here's the second night. I don't know why, but the fourth time everybody seems to get it. It's one, some of those human perception things. Here's the first night. <laughs> here's the second night. Oh, these are actually um, the discovery images of Pluto that, uh, that Clyde Tombaugh took. Clyde Tombaugh. Um, it was a little bit surprised. Everybody was a little surprised because uh, it doesn't look very big. They were looking for something big, something massive that was uh, uh, perturbing the orbit of, um, of, of Neptune. So it couldn't just be a tiny little thing. It had to be this big, giant planet. Uh, and it doesn't look very big. But it doesn't matter because uh, the New York Times headline, um, Ice Planet Discovered, blah, blah, blah. Sighted 25 years after it began, blah, blah, blah. Here's where things go wrong. Um, <laughs> astronomers hail fighting, true. The sphere, possibly larger than Jupiter, um, needs prediction. Uh, so it's actually, the possibly larger than Jupiter is not where it goes wrong. It's the needs prediction. This is one way that science can sometimes get itself off track. Science has a nice way of getting itself back on track when that happens, but, but there was a prediction of a giant planet out there. Somebody found something, therefore it must have been that giant planet that was predicted. It had to be the same thing. Um, possibly larger than Jupiter, uh, that's wrong by a factor of 250,000. Um, we have a word for that these days. Anybody? Anybody? Fake news. It's, it's the New York Times. What do you expect? Um, so, there it is. It's hard to even find it anymore. It's, it's, it's a tiny, tiny little thing. But people had explanations. They thought it was this huge thing. They had explanations for why it looked so small, even though it was so massive. My favorite that I read, this is, again, this is, this is 1930 when it was discovered, and 
you, uh, science has continued to progress since then. So 1930, I think you could still make up sort of crazy stories about things in space and nobody would really uh, call you on it too badly. But here's, here's my favorite crazy story about why Pluto looks so small but is actually massive. One is it's because it is a core of solid uranium. So this is 1930. They don't really know that's a terrible idea just yet. Um, but it's not just a core of solid uranium. It's a core of solid uranium surrounded by a liquid oxygen ocean. So the, the liquid oxygen ocean is transparent. You can't see it. But it's even better because it acts like a lens and it makes the core look even smaller. <laughs> okay, so, um, so that turns out not to be true. Uh, so nobody go home and, and think that this is what this talk was about. But it uh, turns out now, these days, we know why Pluto looks so small. Does anybody know why it looks so small? Because uh, it's small. Yeah, okay. So. <laughs> So here's how small it is. And all this um, silly debate about Pluto being planets or not, here's, there was, there was how small it really is as well. And, and this is where I have to apologize. I, we couldn't get the aspect ratio right, and all my planets are now squashed. And I'm not going to look because it'll really drive me crazy, so I'm going to look at you guys. Um, but pretend like they're all not squashed. They actually look not squashed if you want to sit down here. Um, I don't recommend it, though. So imagine these are all circles instead. So these are the, the real sizes of the real planets. Um, which you almost never see. You, you, you'll see depictions of all the planets uh, like on, on my daughter's lunchbox. Um, they, they're all about the same size. Uh, Mercury is a little smaller and Jupiter is a little bigger, and, and, you know, but they're more or less the same size. It is, it is, even in NASA releases and websites, you'll see things where the planets are more or less all about the same size. They are so not the same size. They're massively different. Here's Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. Uh, huge Jupiter in the background, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Here's the asteroids. Um, Ceres is the biggest asteroid. It's the one that the, the Dawn spacecraft is in orbit around right now that has that funny white spot that everybody's seeing. Um, other asteroids that they're real sizes. And Pluto, put it on there, is, is, is there. Don't miss it. It's that, that tiny little thing that really doesn't fit. And uh, nobody quite knew what to call it back in 1930. But, uh, there was nothing else out there, so calling it a planet seemed like a, a good idea. The weirdest thing about it is that if you look at the giant planets now, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, they actually have circular orbits, ignore the, the squashes. Uh, Pluto's on this crazy oblong orbit that goes inside the orbit of Neptune. And what's even stranger, uh, I think, and, and people thought at the time, is if you tilt this on the side, you see that Pluto doesn't sit in the same disk as the, the planet. Um, it's actually tilted by about 20 degrees. Nobody really knew what to think of it at the time, uh, except that there was nothing else there, and so it didn't. It, it made sense. It was, there was nothing else there, and people thought it was big. And people thought it was big because of that mistake made from the first day that it might be bigger than Jupiter. And so in their heads, it was a planet, and we're just going to call it a planet, and let's not think otherwise. Um, so that was 1930. People continue to search for this mythical planet X. Clyde Tombaugh even did not believe that this was the planet that was perturbing Uranus and Neptune. He thought there needed to be a more massive thing out there. Turns out, um, uh, in 1992, two interesting things happened in 1992. One is that after the final Voyager flyby of, uh, of Neptune, the mass of Neptune was measured really well. Mass of Uranus was doing really well, and astronomers went back and recalculated all the positions of the planets during the masses, and realized that all these ideas that, that Uranus and Neptune were in the wrong positions slightly were wrong. So in this case, Bouvard was exactly right. It was bad observations early on that were causing people to think there was a planet X. There is no need for a massive object that's perturbing the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. The other fun thing that happened in 1992, though, was that the first new object beyond the orbit of Neptune was discovered, also the second object beyond the orbit of Neptune. And then very quickly, many, many, many more objects were found out there in this region that we now call the Kuiper Belt. Um, you'll, you can, their orbits are like the orbit of Pluto. There's Pluto. These orbits, they just look like a bird's nest of crazy orbits. Some of them even go down like this. They go out. When you put Pluto in the perspective of the Kuiper Belt, you realize very quickly that Pluto is not just not this weird oddball planet that doesn't make any sense with respect to the rest of the planets. It's actually just the first discovered of this vast belt of objects that are out here. 
and it's just like them. It has an orbit just like them. It's, it's the same sizes as the biggest ones of these things. And Pluto suddenly went from making no sense at all to suddenly uh, having a complete context. We now understand much better why it's there and, and what it means. And just, just to, uh, to, to show again, there was Pluto again. These, these largest Kuiper Belt objects uh, are you know, similar sizes. There's the biggest ones that fit on the screen there. Uh, there's that Pluto. There's Eris. Some of the, some of the some you may have heard of Eris, Haumea, Maki Maki. Um, some of the bigger ones, but all the smaller ones too. So Pluto is a prominent member of this population. Um, anybody who would say at this lecture series that it's a planet is crazy. I don't know if anybody said this in the last year at this lecture series. Okay. Um, but but clearly it's part of this Kuiper Belt population. But more interestingly, this this. Kuiper Belt population gave us a new way of examining what's going on in the outer solar system. If, when we only had Uranus and Neptune to look at for things being potentially tugged along by something massive out there, well, first, Uranus and Neptune are big, so it takes a lot to push them around. And second, there's just two of them, so you don't get much chances for things to happen. And third, they're still relatively close to the sun. These Kuiper Belt objects are further away from the sun so they're more easily pushed around. They're smaller, so they're more easily pushed around. And there are thousands of them. So you can find the smaller number of them that might have been pushed around. So the, the first one of these that we found that was interesting, that we knew told us something funny was going on in the solar system, is an object that we discovered in uh, 2002, a long time ago now, 2003. 2003. Um, Sedna, does anybody remember this one from way back uh, 15 years ago? I remember this one from way back 15 years ago. Uh, this is one of the first big ones that, that my team discovered, and it was super exciting. Um, it was super exciting because at the time it was discovered, it was the most distant object we had ever seen in the solar system. It was, it was found actually here in its orbit, and we didn't know at the time that it was discovered what kind of orbit it had. We thought maybe it was going to be on a circular orbit like a planet might be. We didn't know how big it was either. Uh, and so we did just like Bouvard did, we went back in time and found observations from previous uh, things where they'd only taken one image in the night. And we, we tracked it down for about 30 years. And the 30-year orbit was enough to make us realize that it has this crazy looping orbit. It takes 12,000 years to go around the sun. And what's weird about Sedna is not just that it's on this crazy looping orbit, but it never actually gets close to Neptune. It would be right here. It never gets close to Neptune. Uh, it looks like something has taken a normal Kuiper Belt object orbit and has pulled it away from the sun or sort of pushed it off in this direction. No other object is like that. You can see all the other ones are in like this. This one looks like a new, new realm in the Kuiper Belt. Uh, a new, and, and the only way we could think of for it to have gotten there is if something, something that we don't see now, something had interacted with it in the past. Now, we didn't know what that something was. It could have been stars four billion years ago. It could have been a planet that's out there now. We didn't know. Um, but we, we put out all these possibilities and suggested that it's, a, it's, a, that it's something worth, worth looking at. And then for 15 years, 10 years, we looked for more objects like it and didn't find a single one. And the first new one that was found like it, I didn't find. Um, this one was found by my former postdoc instead. Another one that was outside the orbit of the rest of the Kuiper Belt. Uh, it was found in 2012. They, they give them these license plate numbers based on the time that it's discovered, so you don't have anything. So, so 2003 BB12 can, tells you that it was discovered in the second week of November, and it was the 12th object discovered. So VP it was also in the second week of November of 2012-2013. And because it was VP, they called it Biden, and it's not my fault. Um, <laughs> I, even I, so Sedna, I would just like to say, Sedna is an awesome name. You can ask me about names later. Sedna is a great name for an object. It's from uh, uh, Inuit mythology. She was the goddess of the sea. Um, it's not my fault. That's all I can say. Um, so when, when they discovered this one, they, they thought it was interesting that it was sort of both pointing off in one direction, but it was uh, not, there was only two objects, and they, they, they didn't really know what was going on. But we, this is when, uh, my, my colleague and I started looking at these. We started realizing that, that if you looked at the most distant objects in the Kuiper Belt, they did something unexpected. That is, 
here's, here's the orbit of Neptune again, so most of the Kuiper Belt is in there, but if you look at the, the six most distant objects at, at, at the time when we realized it was going to be just six, there are many more now. One is they all point out in this way, and two, as you can see, they're all tilted a little bit away from the solar system, or from the, from the disk of, of the planet. That's pretty weird. Um, it's weird because there's, there's no reason that they should be that way. They really should be totally randomly oriented around the sky. It's, there's always a chance that you find six of them and the six happen to be in one direction. You know, you flip a coin six times and get heads. That, that happens too. But the probability that they would be off in one direction or else tilted in one direction, we, we could calculate that and we show that the probability of this happening just by chance was only about 1%. 1%, you know, Things that have a 1% probability happen like, I don't know, one in a hundred times. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but that's still pretty rare. So we, we, we looked to see what else could be an explanation for this. And the one thing that we refused to consider because it was ridiculous is, uh, is the possibility that it might be a planet. And we refused to consider this because we were so tired of all the papers where people said, you know, they would, they would sneeze and say, oh, it must be a planet. I just sneezed. Um, and we didn't want to be yet another of these people suggesting that there was a planet out there based on, you know, some other thing that we had just found. So we looked at, we looked at a ton of different things. We tried, we tried anything we could to get an explanation for this <clears throat> that didn't involve a planet. And finally, after like eight months of, of painstakingly trying everything, we broke down and tested out <clears throat> to see whether a planet would work. Um, and we realized pretty quickly, even just by doing some pretty simple mathematics, sort of like Leverrier did, that a planet, I really wish it could draw some different sizes. What goes there? Uh, let me get it to stop, stop, stop. Did you stop? Yeah, okay. So <coughs> what, we, what we realized is that uh, <coughs> if you put a planet, you know, I can even I can ask my daughter where the planet was, if this is it, and she's like, oh, well, it has to be like this. It's like the big, it's the big, uh, it's a big, big huggy planet. So it hugs, it hugs all the other type of old objects. It keeps them from moving around. It's, uh, it has to be on a very eccentric orbit. It comes back in this way. And it can't intersect any of these orbits because if it intersects the orbits, they'll all get ejected. And uh, we did the map, <coughs> and it turned out to work pretty well that way. And we are like, well, uh, I'm not convinced. And so we decided to do uh, the, the, the next obvious thing, which is to <coughs> Excuse me. Which is to do big, large-scale computer simulations of what it would be like if there really were a planet. So here's what I'm going to show you. I'm going to make sure you understand what it is here. You can't see it here, but you'll see it later. The sun is in here. Neptune is in here. This pink thing, which you can barely see right now, this is the orbit of our hypothetical planet. And each of these blue things is the orbit of test pretend the Kuiper Belt objects that we seeded into the early solar system in a completely random fashion just to see what happens. Now what you'll see is that as time goes on, two, two or three things happen. Um, one is that many of the objects disappear. They get too close to some planets and they get ejected. So very quickly, um, this thing will start to clear out. I'll just start it now so you can see it start to clear out very quickly. The other thing you see is that they move. The orbits orbits uh, are not stationary. Orbits can slowly move all over the place. What we're looking for are orbits to be captured over here. So this, this simulation runs for four billion years. Hope you guys brought snacks. Um, <laughs> but notice, like, there's, it's, uh, much has been cleared out now. These green ones inside here look like they're not affected by this planet at all. They're just going in circles, circulating, circulating. We're looking for ones that get stuck like this one. This one, right? No. That one. No. That one. No. That one. That one, we're not getting that one. It's not working. That one right there. No, no, no. Um, so I have bad news, or maybe interesting news, is it doesn't work. Uh, nothing survives over here, but they all survive over here. This is exactly the opposite of what we thought we were going to see. Um, and at first we were baffled. How could you possibly keep these things and lose everything over here? These things, if you're on an orbit like this, you cross the orbit of this giant planet uh, every time you go around the sun. Um, 
crossing the orbit of a giant planet is generally considered a bad idea, uh, and you should be ejected. And it, at first, we were convinced we just did something wrong. We spent another month or two trying to figure this out, and we finally realized that it actually made perfect sense. This is usually the way it works. First, you think you're stupid, then you realize you're stupid for thinking you're stupid. Um, is that this is the, the the reason that these are the only ones that are stable? Is because this is the way that these objects spend the least time anywhere close to the planet. If you had an orbit like this, when, when a planet's going around the sun, there's the sun, it, it goes quickly through here and then slows down out here and then quickly again. So it spends most of its time out here. If you had this orbit flipped and it spent most of its time out here, then you would be close to the planet most of the time. As it is, the planet spends most of its time over here, these guys spend most of their time over here, then they do a quick plunge, and if they're lucky, they're not doing it at the same time as planet is. And it turns out that they don't have to get lucky. They actually get locked into these resonances, <coughs> as they're called, where they are forced to be far away from the planet. It's the same thing, um, as you remember, Pluto crosses the orbit of Neptune. Pluto, you know, that sounds like a bad idea. Crossing the orbit of a real planet is bad for a fake planet. Um, you would, you would think that it would eventually hit Neptune or get ejected by Neptune, but it's, it's actually in this resonance where every three times Neptune goes around the sun, Pluto goes around the sun precisely two times, and it's designed to never get close. They, they never get close to each other at all. And these guys all do exactly the same thing. So <clears throat> our, our planet that we thought was supposed to be here turns out to be here, and the slight tilt of the Kuiper Belt objects that you can, you can see also tells us that the planet itself has to be slightly tilted too. So from just, um, just, a, just a few considerations, we're already starting to see that, you know, that this orbit, where the planet has to be, what kind of orbit it has to have, where it has to be in the sky, how big it has to be. So this is pretty exciting. So um, my colleague, I, I only said my colleague before, I should give him a name, is uh, Konstantin Batygin. Uh, at, at Caltech with me, just, just down the hall. It's been really fun, because he and I basically wore out the carpeting in, in the hallway uh, during this time period. He would find something new doing the theoretical stuff, I'd find something new doing observational stuff, and we'd run back and forth. And there was this moment <coughs> when he was sitting in my office, and we were trying to decide what to do, because it was kind of compelling, but it was, but it was only kind of compelling. It was a nice theory. Um, but you know, so many people have jumped up and down and said that there were planets, and it just, it, it's embarrassing to stand in front of people and say that you think there's a planet, uh, because this is crazy people have said this. You know, what are we gonna say? Yes, everybody who said this for the last 150 years has been crazy, but we're not. But the answer is, yeah, that's what it is. Um, so here's, here's why I actually believe it. So we were sitting in my office, and we were trying to understand one in mystery, which is that if the planet goes like this, and there are objects that go on like this. We predicted that there should be one other family of objects that we didn't see, and that's, those are objects that are not aligned in the opposite direction as the planet. Planet here, objects here, but are perpendicular. And not just perpendicular um, in the direction, but also their orbits are perpendicular to the rest of the solar system. So they, they're going straight up and down, plunging into and out of the solar system. And, all of our computer simulations predict that these, these things should be there, and they don't exist, and they shouldn't exist, and they can't not exist, and our theory failed, and we were depressed. Um, and then, as, as Constantine is sitting in my office, I, I had this glimmer, like, you know, there is one set of objects, there's one object that I know of that kind of sounds like that, and we looked up that one object and plotted its coordinates, and it didn't quite fit, but it made me realize that my head, you know, you. It's amazing when you tell the story how stupid you sound, um, because I'm going to tell you that I, I, was, I completely had blinders on what I was looking at. I had been thinking that we can only look at things that are beyond the orbit of Neptune, because Neptune is going to perturb anything that comes inside, and so I ignored anything that comes inside Neptune. If you don't, if you look at objects that come all the way into the orbit almost of Jupiter, but then go really far out, there are objects that are perpendicular. And there are six of them. They're not very many. Um, they don't get uh, hurt by Neptune because they come plunging in really quickly, perpendicularly. And so we realized they were there, and I said, Constantine, let's figure out where they are. Are they going to be exactly where we predicted them or not? And so we plotted them, uh, not quite on this screen, but we plotted them something like this. 
And here's where they are. It's hard to tell until we tilt it up here. These things are exactly where we predicted they should be. They should be perpendicular this way. We even predicted there should be more on this side than on this side. Um, and they are they're exactly where our theory predicted they should be. This is great. This is what you want as a scientist. You want to, you want to not just explain a phenomenon, but you want to predict something that wasn't known before and then have that come true. And it's even better if you can do that all in the space of about five minutes while you're sitting in your office because you were stupid enough not to have looked at this before. Um, so th this is the moment for, for me and, and for Constantine also. I mean, our jaws kind of hit the floor at this point. Um, this is the moment for me it went from cute theory that can kind of explain something but I don't really believe it to, oh, there's a big planet out there. Um, there is no other explanation. So. This is the moment when we decided we would we would go ahead and, and uh, write the paper and say we think there's a, a massive planet to be found out there. We were pretty convinced um, that we would quickly we would quick, quickly be shot at. We didn't think we'd be shot down because we thought we'd be, we were pretty right. But you know, any the, the paper got a lot of press and attention, and, and any any self-respecting astronomer wants to destroy a paper that gets a lot of press and attention. So um, we were prepared for the destruction. And in the two, two and a half, two years, two years since the paper came out, there's still no other explanation for this. And I, I think the reason that there's no other explanation is because this is what's going on. Um, not only that, in the, in the two years since it came out, here are our original six objects, one, two, three, four, five, six, all swept off in one direction. Um, they're, they're hard to find. Here's two more in the right direction. One, actually, right before this paper came out, we predicted that there should be some in the opposite, perfectly opposite direction to it's another one. So now we have nine in the right direction, one like we predicted in the wrong direction. And in the next couple of months, um, a couple of new surveys are going to come out, and there are like six more all in the right direction. Um, it's, it's pretty hard to explain these phenomena uh, as anything other than there's a giant planet out there. I, I, think, it, I, think, it is, I think it's real. Um, not everybody's convinced. There are, people are, there are astronomers who are skeptical just because scientists are naturally skeptical people as they should be. I think if, if somebody else had published this paper, I'd have been like, <sighs> um, so I get it. I get it. But it's, it's good to have the skeptics because then you can show them wrong, and it's much more fun that way. Um, OK. so. I keep on saying planet out there. So there's a planet out there. What do we know about it? Well, I showed you that we know about what kind of orbit it has. What about how big it is? That's, that's what you really want to know um, if, you're, if you're talking about planets. The way we know about how big it is is from those computer simulations I was showing you. So we, we do those computer simulations, and we can change around our planets. We can change around the orbit of our planet. We can change around everything. And in the two years since the first paper came out, we have run hundreds of thousands of these simulations trying to pin down what the planet looks like. And we found that if the planet's, if the planet's a little bit too small, it, like in, in mass, nothing happens. If it's too big, it kind of destroys the solar system. Um, so and that's probably bad. Uh, so there's this, there's this sweet spot of, of mass that it should be. And that sweet spot comes in to be just about 10 times the mass of the Earth. So. Uh, in, in these units, Neptune is 17 times the mass of the Earth. Uranus is 14.5. Earth is one times the mass of the Earth. Um, and planet nine looks like about 10 Earth masses. It could be seven, it could be 12. I don't think it could be five. I don't think it could be 15. Um, but 10 is just about right. 10 Earth masses, it turns out, is, is a special mass. Um, the, the moment that we realized it was around 10 Earth masses, both Constantine and I just immediately thought, oh, oh, that makes perfect sense. I would have predicted that had I thought to predict something. Um, here's why 10 Earth masses makes a lot of sense. One is 10 Earth masses, so we don't have, other than now maybe planet nine, we don't have any 10 Earth mass things in our solar system. We skip from Earth uh, all the way up to, to Uranus uh, with nothing in between. So these rocky things, these gassy things, nothing in between. But if you look at stars, in our galaxy, and you look at their planets, 10 Earth masses is about the most common mass planet in our galaxy. We don't have one, sad to be us, but everybody else does. Um, so if you were going to guess a mass of a planet, you might just guess that based on that argument. It's the most common mass there is out there. 
But I think the more interesting thing about 10 Earth masses is that 10 Earth masses is, is not just common in other, um, around other stars. 10 Earth masses is about the mass of the rocky core inside of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus, and Neptune are very different sizes. And each of them has about a 10 Earth mass core inside. Do you think that's how they form? They form this rocky core first, and then all the gas secretes onto them? So we think, and this is, this is just speculation because our, our idea that there's a planet out there doesn't tell us anything about how it got there. But we think that we have a, a, a reasonable explanation for how it got there, which is that when the solar system was forming, um, a rocky core formed that was going to become Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and another one started forming that, that was going to become Planet Nine. But that Planet Nine core was packed in a little too tightly with the other ones, and it would interact with Jupiter or Saturn and get ejected to the outer part of the solar system, where it's been hanging around ever since then. That's such an uncontroversial ideal idea that, uh, um, as part of his PhD thesis, Constantine actually wrote a paper um, doing simulations of exactly that, not even thinking about Planet Nine, but just like, hey, what would happen if there were a fifth giant planet core? How would it affect the solar system? And it works pretty well, actually, and so people now are kind of think that's probably true, that there were five giant planets to begin with. Just no one ever thought about what happened to that fifth one, but I think it's out there, uh, watching, waiting. Um, so, we know approximately how big it is. Um, we think that as a 10 Earth mass object, if it was a, originally a rocky core, it would have gotten some gas with it. It wouldn't have just been a totally rocky core, it had some gas. Um, and so it would, it would, that's, that's a pretty good description, actually, of, of Neptune and Uranus. They're mostly rocky core with a little bit of gas, unlike Jupiter and Saturn, which are little rocky core, huge gas. So we think Planet 9 is actually like a miniature version of Neptune, as opposed to a big version of the Earth. We don't think like it's a 10 Earth mass solid ball of rock or ice or hamburger or something. Um, we, think it's, we think it's a gas. And that's why we draw it like this in the artist's conception. We even draw in clouds and lightning because it just looks cool when we do that. Um, okay, so we know about what the orbit's like. We know how it's tilted. We know about how big it is. We know about how, what, where it should be. Let's go find it. So one of the nice things about being in Caltech is that you have access to really good telescopes that are, that are owned by Caltech. Here are the, the two Keck telescopes on the big island of Hawaii on top of Mauna Kea. You see there's, there's Maui in the background. Um, these are great telescopes, uh, and I've used them for most of my career, and they're totally worthless for the search. Um, they're totally worthless for the search because all telescopes, big telescopes specialize in different things, and the Keck telescopes are going to be fantastic when we find Planet Nine and we want to study it in detail. They're the best in the world at detailed studies. But if you want to just survey vast swaths of sky, we need a telescope that has specialized in looking at vast swaths of sky. There is one, and it's right next door. That's the Subaru Telescope, which is the, uh, the national telescope of, uh, Hawaii, of Hawaii, of Japan. And one of the things that they specialize in doing is building these ridiculously large cameras to cover big areas of the sky at once. So let me show you, just because I find this amazing. Here's, here's the camera on the telescope. This is not the telescope. This is the camera that sits on the top of the telescope. Um, it's, it's so big that it's bigger than an anime character. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> This is a lens at the bottom. This is the, the world's largest lens, um, I was told. Is that really true? You, you're told these things, and then you say them out loud, and you're like, maybe that's what they said. It's, it's made by Canon, um, and it's, it go, it's the lens that goes into the, the camera that's right in here. So the camera, let me show you the, the telescope itself. Yeah, it's kind of dark. You can't see. The camera's actually a tiny little blip up there at the very top. There's me. Uh, Constantine um, can't tell, but you could, you could, if you could see carefully, you could tell that he's, he's a theoretical astronomer. <laughs> Doesn't do so well on top of mountains. He's, he has had, he has an oxygen mask on to, to breathe oxygen because it's a little hard for him. Um, it's okay. He's, he's a good guy anyway. We couldn't have found it without him, so I, I, I let him help me involved in the search. Um, so we're searching. We did a calculation and, and uh, decided that it would, it would take something like 20 nights on the Subaru telescope. 
the 20 nights is this interesting number of nights. Um, it sounds like a not very, not, not very long amount of time, right? Um, just give me 20 nights, I'll be done. Uh, and the answer is yeah, it's not very much. But other astronomers apparently think that what they're doing is important also. And so they won't give me all the telescope time. So the 20 nights is going to take us like four or five years to get all that nights on the telescope. So we're, we're about a third of the way through our big search area. And we're looking. So where are we looking? Well, i got to tell you, if I could pick an area of the sky, any area of the sky, and to, to put Planet Nine in so I could describe it to people, um, it's, it's one that I think is one of the best areas in the whole sky. If you go out tonight, it's probably cloudy, so don't go out tonight. But go out some night when it's not cloudy and, and look over towards the sunset, and you'll see, you'll see a view sort of like this. Um, I, I, I think this has to be everybody's favorite constellation, or at least one of the most recognized ones. Here's Orion um, doing battle here. With, uh, with Taurus, the bull. There is uh, the Pleiades, which is in Japanese, Subaru, which is why it's the Subaru telescope and why the Subaru that you drive has the Pleiades on it. Um, uh, it's not true that if you drive a Subaru, you get more time on the Subaru telescope. Um, <laughs> I tried that, it didn't work out. So I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful patch of sky. This is where you would, you know, you could describe this cosmic battle going on. And this is, this is where we think it is. This is uh, our search area is right here, um, right between Orion and, well, through Taurus. There's the, the horns of Taurus. I should be kind of off because we're right there in the horns of Taurus. Uh, or right, right up in this region. We've done about, well, that's our, that's our single best predicted spot. I don't think it's in the single best predicted spot, but that's our best predicted spot so far. We actually looked exactly at that spot three weeks ago at the Super Telescope, but it was cloudy, so we didn't see anything. Um, so we haven't gotten to that spot yet. We've done this part down through here um, in our, the, the little bit of time we've had. We, I hope maybe we can even get most of the rest of it next year. We've had extraordinarily terrible weather um, in the last two years at the telescope. So we, we should have covered much more than this, but that's just, this is all we have so far. So I, I, I want you to uh, uh, stare at the spot in the sky for a minute. I want you to do one thing. Um, so it's easy to come to one of these talks and like, oh, isn't that cool, new planet, blah, blah, blah. Very abstract, blah, blah, blah. But, but this is not like, you know, black holes at the edge of the universe doing weird dark matter energy things that no one understands. This is like a planet in our solar system out there on the edge of our, our, our solar system. It's a planet that if it's found, when it's found, and it will be found, um, when it's found, we will certainly go there. Uh, we'll, we'll figure out ways to get missions out there. This is, this is going to be part of our neighborhood. This is going to be part of what people learn about for hundreds of years to come. And it's really out there. So I want you to go out. If it's clear when you go out tonight, it might be a little too late by the time you go out, go find Orion, find Taurus, and look at that spot and just think to yourself, there really is. There's a planet out there that's just lurking, waiting to be found. Um, I, I think it's just as exciting a thing as as there could be in the sky. And as an astronomer who gets to go out and, and play and try to find it, I mean, that's, that's just the best possible thing in the world. So I just want to um, uh, end on one quick note that I started on, which was, of course, anybody recognize the poster? So stolen fair and square from, from Plan 9 from outer space. Um, famous for worst movie ever made. So it's, it's uniformly known as as the worst movie ever made. I mean, I don't know why. I mean, it's got like Vampira fighting Dracula, Alien. Uh, I don't, is, is anyone, has anyone honestly watched the whole thing all the way through? Pretty good, I've tried. It's, it's on, it's actually, it's on YouTube. You can actually watch the whole thing on YouTube. I dare you, um, I really do. Uh, but it was, you know, it was prescient in some ways. And, and uh, in the way that I find it most amazing is that this, this was 19, I should have looked up the date, 1960 something when it came out. Um, so think of it this way, you know, it's only like 20 years after the discovery of, of Pluto. People are realizing now that Pluto's not as massive as they thought it was, but, uh, but still, it was, you know, considered a planet in good standing for many decades to come. And, and then here, so here's the, in the graveyard scene, they're, they're digging up zombies or burying zombies. Anybody know what they're doing? I don't know, but, but look at the graveyard scene. And there's this, there's this tombstone right there. And, and I want you to just look really carefully at that tombstone. Um, <laughs> who knew? 
so thank you for coming out tonight, and I'll be uh, happy to take questions. On behalf of the Center for Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics and the Barrett family who made this possible, I'm very grateful to Mike for his wonderful talk. And now Paul Sutter, our colleague, is going to MC questions. Thank you. Can I take the kids' questions first? Of course, of course, yeah. So uh, I'll run the microphone up. Kids do have priority in these events. Oh, man. Here I come. All right, what's your question? program was used to run those simulations? I do know which program is used um, because I ran it. I ran those simulations. So, and it's actually, it's free. It's available to download. Um, it's not, it's pretty easy, but it's not, it's not designed for, you know, just easy poking, but it's, but it's, but it's called, um, it's called Mercury. Um, if you, if you Google Mercury orbital simulations, it's, it's totally free. And if you figure out how to run it, and you, uh, if you, you want to run some for me, let me know. Uh, we, we've got a lot that we need to run. <laughs> All right, another question back here. How long did it take you to make your book? Uh, how long did it take me to make my book? Um, so uh, I, I, I wrote most of the book in about a year. I had written some of it earlier, um, but I went, you know, it's the sort of thing that it's if you sit down and do it. I, so I went to my favorite coffee place, um, close to my office, every morning for two hours for most of a year, and, and drank a lot of coffee and wrote the book there. We have another question in the middle. You picked the wrong spot, dude. Yeah. You can yell. Go ahead, yell. Make it happen. So, so the bad news, let me show you the bad news. Good question. So the, the question is um, that there are the Voyager spacecraft, there are a couple of spacecraft actually leaving the solar system. And you know, wouldn't that be cool if they accidentally ran into Planet Nine or at least were, were perturbed by Planet Nine or something happened? So Planet Nine, we're pretty convinced Planet Nine is out here in its most distant part of its orbit, um, which is why it's, being, it's hard to see. The, the Voyagers are all going this way. Um, the New Horizons spacecraft that went by Pluto, going this way. Um, the Pioneer spacecraft actually are going out there too. They're all going this way. So they all go, they, they all go that way for a reason. They, the, the scientists who study the outer parts of our solar system are, are really interested in, in this side, less interested in this side, believe it or not, um, because of the way the magnetic field of the galaxy interacts with uh, the magnetic field of the sun, all the, all the actions over here. They all go to that side. So, uh, when we find Planet Nine and we send the spacecraft out this way, it'll be the first time sending one down that way. And I suspect the people who study the Earth's, the Sun's magnetic magnetosphere, will actually be kind of interested because it'll be a new area to explore there too. Um, but we'll go see a new planet, which will be even better. All right, right up front. Um, what inspired you to get into planetary astronomy, and what can young people these days do? Um, do to get into it. So what inspired me to get into to planetary astronomy, I, I didn't know when I, I so I, I wanted to be a, an astronomer from as, as early as I can remember. As early as I can remember is second grade is the first time I said to my mother, I want to be an astronomer. And I, so I might have been earlier, um, but I remember it was early as second grade. Um, and then, you know, I wanted to study dinosaurs for a while and fly airplanes and you know, all those things that, that kids want to do. But, I, but the astronomy really stuck with me. Um, I would never have guessed that I would become a planetary astronomer. When I, even when I went to uh, graduate school, I thought I would study distant galaxies uh, or something because you know, what, what is there to do in the solar system? Shouldn't we know all the planets already? Uh, and so I didn't, I didn't realize. It took me a while. Um, but, but for me, what really inspires me about being a planetary astronomer and what I like about it is that I, I feel like it's, it's, it's basic exploration. It's, you know, so there's, there's a lot of interesting science that we're trying to learn and study how these things work. But in some ways, we are just exploring, we're carrying on the exploration that you know, started with voyages around the world and then uh, voyages to the moon. And we're, we're, we're trying to find what our neighborhood is like. 
Um, so to, to get into a field like this, I mean, it's, it's not, there's, there's nothing special you have to do. You just have to decide that's what you're going to do. Uh, most people who go into um, astronomy, when they go to college, you know, they're, they're, they like math and science and, and, and um, high school, and they go into college and maybe physics, maybe astronomy, and then just love it enough to keep going. So the main thing you need to do is, is love it and keep going, or, or decide you only kind of love it and keep it as a fun thing you'll think about it and do something else. But if you love it, just keep going. Excellent. Another question right here. What, happened if, what would happen if Planet 9 just disappeared or if it changed orbit really quickly? It would blow my mind. Um, planets can't do that. Uh, so, so what would happen? I mean, I can I can answer that hypothetically. So you can in my simulations I can remove it instantaneously. But you know, planets don't just change orbits or disappear. So it's not going to happen. But if you did take away Planet Nine, all of those objects, the, the things that are lined up, would slowly drift apart. In about 200 million years, they would be randomly distributed around the sky. Um, and, and that's kind of it. <laughs> there would be no effect on us. Um, planet 9 has no effect on us now. I mean, so Planet 9 is, is smaller than Neptune, and it's 20 times further away than Neptune, and Neptune doesn't even have an effect on us. So, so Planet 9 really has no effect on us at all. All right, question in the back. Why was Pluto considered not a planet anymore in 2006? Um, I would say the real answer to that is, is because it had it coming. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the real answer, I mean, I think it's pretty easy to, to see the answer to that question by looking at these strangely squashed planets. Um, if, you were, if you were starting from scratch, I mean, so the, the other question to ask yourself is, why the heck was it ever a planet to begin with? And the answer is because we were mistaken about um, what else was around and also mistaken about how big it was. If you start from scratch and you say to yourself, look, here's the solar system. Here are the objects. There are, I don't know, let's not think about what to call them, but there are big things that are mostly gassy. There are small things that are mostly rocky. There are tiny things that are mostly rocky. And there are other tiny things that are mostly icy. Um, I'm pretty sure that that's how you would categorize the solar system. You would make those four categories. Uh, you would never say, well, you know, there are these eight big things and we're going to add in this one too. We'll call that a planet. You know, it just, it just fits. It, it's, so some people would answer that question that it doesn't matter, that it's just semantics. And, I, and that's, just, that's just wrong. It's actually, it actually matters a lot because it's classification. And classification is the first thing we do as scientists to even help us understand which question to ask. When you categorize these things correctly, you ask the question, why are these four giant gassy planets here? Why are these other things out here? If, you're, if you put one of these things as a planet, your, your questions are even kind of weird. So it was the, it was the new discoveries and the realization that, that Pluto belongs with this other set of objects that's the real reason why. All right, right here. I want to ask questions. Uh, why did you kill Pluto? <laughs> I, I would say that that's the same answer, with the easy version being because it had it coming. Um, but but that's why. I mean, it's, it's, it really is this. It's it's not. I I think that you really should think of it not that Pluto was demoted, um, but rather you should think Pluto should never have been called a planet to begin with, and we we made a mistake in 1930 and finally fixed it. Um, but it took a long time to fix because it took, we, we, we didn't know about all these other objects um, until relatively recently. But when we found all these other ones and realized that's what Pluto was part of, um, it makes much more sense to classify things that way. All right. All right. Um, I have a two-parter. First is, are you able to calculate the length and time of the orbit to be predicted by nine lab? Yes. So how, how long does it take Planet 9 to go around the sun? We have, we have a, a range, because the one thing we don't know very well, when, when I show you these orbits, um, like that one, I can show you that one. When I show you these orbits, um, what we know really well is how close it comes to the sun, because that's kind of where it does all its damage. It could go here. It could go here. It could go here. And, and the further it goes, 
longer take to go around the sun. So it's something like 10, 10 to 20,000 years to go around the sun. So if you said 10,000 years, would you be able to find correlated events, like say asteroids being pulled out of the Kuiper belt? Yeah, so. Would they the same frequency that 10,000 years is say off the record? Yeah, so that's a great question. You know, what, what does it do when it comes close? Um, but then you have to remember, because it sounds, you know, pretty dramatic. Uh, it sounds so dramatic that I get wacko emails from people all the time asking if we're going to get destroyed by Planet Nine. Um, but I'll remind you again, it's 10 Earth masses. It's the Kuiper Belt is right here, right next to 17 Earth mass Neptunes all the time. And this thing is way the heck out here, swoops by every 10,000 years, and it's only 10 Earth masses. It's so far away, and so relatively uh, unmassive that, that it actually it just doesn't do very much. It, it does a lot for these things, um, but, it's, but it's only if you look at it over 4 billion years. So, you couldn't, you couldn't find anything that happened 5,000 years ago or 15,000 years ago or anything. Um, we, we keep on hoping maybe there's some caveat that we haven't come up with that maybe we could come up with something where it did it. And we still, we, we can't figure out anything it actually does like to the Kuiper Belt. It basically has no effect. Too All right, next question right here. I don't know where you are. There. Um. So when do people plan on sending a satellite to you the Planet 9? Yeah, so first we have to find it, um, so we know which way to go. Uh, actually, yeah, we do have to find it. We can launch it now. And get, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's so far away. Uh, it, it could take, you know, even getting to Pluto um, took 10 years, and this, this is uh, at least 20 or 30 times further than Pluto. So that's, you know, a couple hundred years. That seems crazy. Um, but there are ways to get there faster. And with a, with a group at, at JPL, um, I've actually been involved in these studies of trying to get things to go super fast in the outer solar system. Even before we were thinking about Planet Nine, people wanted to get super fast in the outer solar system. The way, the trick to get there fast is, is you know, these gravitational slingshots that everybody uses. So all of the ones that we see orbits of, they, they do this gravitational slingshot off of Jupiter because it's big. But there's something bigger than Jupiter, the sun. So the best way to do it is to start at the Earth, head straight for the sun, and whip around the backside of the sun, and you'll be going super fast. So it's, it's actually not impossible to do even now. So I, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that uh, when we find it, people will first start um, talking about sending this mission, and within, I don't know, within 10 years of discovery, it'd be hard for me to imagine that there's not a mission either on its way or on its way to being on its way. In here, in the middle, because uh, I'm stuck. Uh, okay. When we find Planet Nine yeah. and you get the opportunity, opportunity to name it, what will you call it? Oh, so I forgot to tell you. Um, as astronomers, we're, we're very superstitious. Um, and one of my biggest superstitions is if you think about names ahead of time, bad luck and you won't find it. So not going not gonna to even speculate. I, I mean, I honestly have not even thought about it at all. I love naming. Uh, naming of all these Kuiper Belt objects that we found has been just a super fun thing to get to do. Um, you know, we try to have every name be meaningful for the object that it is. Um, if you, if, you, if you try to give me suggestions, I'm going to stick my fingers in my ears. <laughs> all right, now we're off to your can right. You, can, I get, can I get one right here in front? Yeah, go for it. Okay, I'm going to get this one right in front. Oh, yeah, in this, in this picture, what is this bright star? So it turns out that, that all of these stellar backgrounds in all of these simulations that I've showed are the real sky. So this is what you really would see if you were above the sun looking down. So it's, it's, it's probably unfortunate that it sits in the middle right there because it's confusing. But it's actually Alpha Centauri, believe it or not. And it's just, just because that's where it happens to be, not because it has anything to do with anything. But that's where it is. You got a second question. Have I been on the show How the Universe Works? If I say I think so. I, I think so. Have you seen me on that show? Yeah, okay. Uh, yes, yeah, somebody said they were a Pluto killer. That might be me. 
Yes, I have been on that show. I've been I've been on a lot of shows, and I it's embarrassing to say I can't remember what they all are. All right, question here. Um, this may be off topic, but that oval shaped dwarf planet. Yeah. Why is it like that? No, there's not. It's not off topic. That's the best topic. Um, well, let's go back. So that's Haumea. Uh, Haumea, which I got to name. Haumea is the Hawaiian goddess of childbirth. Um, we discovered Haumea when my wife was pregnant. Um, there it is. It really is shaped like that. I mean, it's bizarre, right? Everything else was kind of round, and that one's shaped like that. The reason it's shaped like that is because it's spinning. It's the fastest spinning object in the solar system that's like a big object. I mean, I could take a rock and spin it faster, but, but it's the fastest big object spinning. It, it spins end over end in four hours, and it's a, in its long axis here, it's as big as Pluto, and it's short, it's a, it's a lot smarter, smaller. It's a weird, weird object. So it spins super fast. It's also um, got a thin layer of ice uh, over the top of, uh, of, of a bunch of rock, and it has a couple of moons around it, and it's got debris that it flung throughout the solar system that you can track down. So early on in the history of the solar system, it probably was round and not spinning very fast. And then it got hit by something else and uh, started spinning really fast, turned into that shape, chunks were flying everywhere. And just this last year, it was also discovered that it has a ring around it, which makes no sense to me at all. I have no idea why it has a ring. But it's a, that's, it's a pretty cool object. It's the strangest object in the solar system, I think. So it's good, good to call it out. It's a weird one. I, if anybody, um, you know, these, these things are kind of fun. You guys are, are close enough. Does anyone, if you go to, up to Chicago and go to the Asimov Planetarium, um, they have a whole Planet Nine show there that, that I helped them put together. It's a, it's a great show, actually. And we talk a lot about these other dwarf planets in there, too, and how man is one of the cool ones that gets talked about. If you get a chance, go check it out. It's a good show. You'll, you'll know the ending because it's all about these planet nine. All right, now we're way in the back, dead center, way up high. What are the uh, theories you use to find that the orbit of the planet nine is the other way? So that, that's a great question. What's the theory we use to find that the orbit of planet nine is the other way? Well, I mean, the, the funny thing about that is that the theory that we used to understand the orbit of planet nine is really, it's, it's, it's basically the same sort of theory that Leverrier used to define Neptune. Um, as a name, it's called secular perturbation theory. And it makes one really important assumption. This is the, the interesting thing about, about theories. You have to make sure you know what your assumptions are in your theories. And the, the one big assumption that it made is that the theory doesn't work for any orbits that cross other orbits. So we couldn't use our theory to look for something like this. So we had to have found that it worked like something like that. We thought that made sense because we didn't think orbit crossing made any sense. So that's what, this is why our original theory didn't work out. So to realize it was going the opposite way was not, not so much a theory as it was simply just these, these crazy computer simulations. It was, it was more of an observation. We did the, the, the computer simulations, and every time we did them, they went in the opposite way, and we had to think, why is that? So then we had to kind of after the fact, construct a theory as to why that was true. Um, so that was just sort of a resonance theory. But it was, but that was that was an after the fact theory, which is less satisfying than making a prediction theory. All right, we're still in the back to your right. Um, so I know that gravitational lensing has given us the ability to view various stars, is there a possibility of ever using gravitational lensing to find Planet Nine? No. Next question. No. Okay. So, let me <laughs> so gravitational lensing is really cool. So you can, you, you know, you can, it, it works by having, I guess, you're here, the thing you care about is here, and you get lucky to have a star or a galaxy or something in between, and the gravity of that in-between thing acts like a lens it magnifies this thing behind you. But if you think about that for a minute, you can see why it's not going to work for Planet Nine. Planet Nine is close. There's nothing that's ever going to be in front of it that's massive like a star. Um, it might pass it in front of other things, but it's not massive enough for gravitational lens. So I, as far as I can tell, we're going to have to do kind of just the old school 
Persian style, go out and look and find it. Uh, or we have some other clever tricks that we're working on that we're still, I think, going to have to do that one. Still hanging out in the back, this time on yeah. your left. Hi there. I have a two-parter. Um, first one might be a little bit blasphemous, but uh, after your 20 day or your 20 nights searching, oh yeah, uh, if you don't find what you're looking for, are you going to move on to new questions, or are you going to? Yeah, no, that's I, that, that's that's a great question. That's that's not I mean. So if we really got 20 nights and we and we uh, got that whole section of the sky, the, the, the problem is. You, you can never be 100% efficient at covering, even when you're covering the sky, there'll always be little holes. Like, what if Planet Nine happened to be right in front of a bright star on the night that you were looking in the wrong spot? So you'll never, this is actually keeps me up at night. Well, I mean, it keeps me up at night. Um, you'll never know, if you don't find it, you'll never know that if, if it was because it's not there or because you did, it, you uh, just didn't happen to look at the right place at the right time, which is, really frustrating. So the right thing to do would be to, to go back and do it again, but no one's going to give you 20 more nights in the telescope to go back and do it again. Um, so I try not to think about this too much because I get depressed, but so we, 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 we try to think about what you would do. This is why we have some of these other backup plans as to, as to how to track it down, how to pinpoint it better, um, other telescopes we can use. It's, I, I really hope that we just find it in our normal search, because it's it's it's, it's going to be painful if we don't find it the first time around. Is the real answer? Thank you. Thank you. The second part was, and maybe you just answered with that question, but uh, are there other? And maybe I missed it, but are there other telescopes like the Subaru that, with other people looking in different parts of the world? Or so there are there are actually other people using the Subaru to look for it, um, which is uh, which which is fun. Um, and then there's, there are some people using some telescopes in, in South America that are not as good that I don't think it's going to have much of a chance of finding it. What we're exploring is the possibility that maybe we can do it at uh, using different methods, maybe looking at it in, in uh, from radio emissions or, or um, other types of telescopes where we might be able to do it. Um, we don't know yet. We're gonna, I, I hope we should find it. Okay. But I want to think about it. All right, we're back down here to your right. Mysterious voice, there we are. Um, what are you planning on to figure out about Planet Nine? Oh, like when we find it, what are we gonna do? Yeah, so I'm, I am, so I talk all about finding Planet Nine, finding Planet Nine, but, but really, scientifically, it's the, the discovery is, is cool and all, but it's the, it's the studying of the planet once you find it that tells you things. So first off, we only have four giant planets in our solar system, and there are these ten Earth mass planets all around the galaxy that we don't know very much about. So we get we get to study one, and we get to see what another giant planet is like. So here, are things that we're going to do like the very first day, um, if if we find it soon enough, we're going to use the Hubble Space Telescope to look to see if it has moons or rings. Um, it should, I think. There's no reason why it shouldn't. Um, so we're going to go look for, for moons and rings. We're going to use the Keck telescopes that I, that I uh, showed you pictures of to look at its atmosphere to try to understand what, what kind of planet it is. Um, and we're going to use another a radio telescope that's right next to the Keck telescope from Mauna Kea to see if we can tell how hot it is, which would tell us about what it's been doing for the past four and a half billion years. So those are the things we want to do right away. And then everybody else who studies giant planets will want to study it for, for years to come. So it's going to be an exciting thing to study. And unfortunately, this is going to be the last question in the audience tonight. But after, Mike Brown will be available for a meet and greet right in the lobby to keep asking questions, keep talking, uh, to keep him here all night and up all night. Because he's an he's used to that, so it should be fine. Thank you. Um, this might be a little bit of a tangent, but why are the planets in the same plane? Oh, yeah, so that's, that's a great question. Why are the planets all in one plane? This is, this is a question. Um, that was answered more or less correctly by, by Immanuel Kant in, I don't know when he wrote this, 1755. See? We knew that right off the top of my head. Um, 
which is, is that the, the planet's all formed from a rotating disk of gas and dust. And as you have this rotating disk of gas, gas and dust, it all settles down to one plane and they all form in this one plane. So everything in the solar system formed in one uh, very thin plane. And anything that you see that's out of the plane, something has happened to it. So the fact that all these Kuiper Belt objects are, are off in crazy orbits is because, mostly because of Neptune. Um, the fact that Planet Nine is on a crazy orbit is explained by that idea that we had that it, it got ejected by Jupiter or by Saturn. Asteroids in the same way, comets in the same way. So if you were, uh, if, you, if nobody's messed with this, is actually another reason why I, I, I like um, the idea that you know these, these the planets are the things that uh, that are the ones that are messing with all the little objects. And so you know if, if you're if you're in a circular orbit, uh, it's because you're a, a big old planet that nobody's messing with. Doesn't work in other planetary systems. That's not a great definition, but but that's that's why they're all that way. And so anytime you see anything that's not circular or not in the same plane, the first question should be what happened. And usually the answer is Neptune, but now the answer is Neptune or Planet Nine. All right, now, before we give Dr. Brown the warm applause that he so richly deserves, I'm going to bring John back up because you're going to give him a prize. I know, right? A new car. No, it's not a car. <laughs> we can't afford a car. Okay. Everybody, look under, everybody look under your seat. <laughs> <laughs> so on behalf of CCAP and uh, with the generous support of the Baird family, we'd like to thank you for your lecture tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's give another hand to Dr. Brown. Thank you so much. He will be available in the lobby to take questions in the chat and to have a good time. Thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for this special presentation. We hope you enjoyed your show. At this time, it's now for me. There are trash cans located in the lobby as you leave.